my feet are size 10. Now that's US size 10. I don't have like weird freakish size feet. That's a normal size foot for me. I'm just under six foot tall. And so size 10 feet make sense. However, those size 10 feet are 4E wide, which means my feet are ridiculously wide. They're practically duck feet. Okay, I have to order shoes specially online because nobody stocks 4E width shoes. My point is, I promise I have a point. My point is that some things that seem ordinary or inconsequential can be more significant than you think. For example, if you look at section 1.7.1 of the Linux Plus exam objectives, you're going to notice that here it says these procedures restart a service and reload a service. Now on the surface, it seems like referencing the same exact thing, but it's very significant the difference between them because when you reload a service, it just stays running and tries to reload the configuration changes that you've made. Whereas restart will stop the process, start the process and try to load configuration files in manually. Now, the reason that is significant is if you make a change to a configuration file on a Linux server, for example, and you reload the service and something you screwed up in the configuration would stop it from starting, it will usually stay running and just give you an error like, whoa, something's wrong with this configuration file, boss. I cannot reload this. But if instead you make the change and then you restart the service, the service will be like, okay, shutting down. And then it will try to start back up. And since it doesn't have anything currently running, it's going to say, I cannot start because you did something horrible to my configuration file. So in general, it's a really, really good idea to reload a process after you make configuration changes. And assuming that goes well, it's also usually a good practice to follow up restarting to make sure that it actually will restart right. But if you just make a change and restart the service, you might be in trouble because the service might not start up, especially if it's something that needs to stay running all the time. Now we're going to look at the command line and see how to make changes to configurations, how to restart or reload those services. And then just a couple other random things that were just in those objectives. But first let's feed the birds. All right. Oh, it's been raining all day. This is wet, but we're going to add some new seed in here. Now, basically, um, one of the things we're not going to cover too deeply is the RPM save and RPM new files. When you install something in a Red Hat based system or an RPM based system, if there is a new configuration file, uh, but you already have one in place, it will save the new default configuration to a file called the configuration file dot conf dot RPM new. And if the configuration change is big enough that you really should update your configuration file during the installation, it'll ask you say, Hey, do you want to use the new config? Because there's a lot of new stuff in there. And if you say yes, it will replace the existing configuration file that was on your system and it will save your old one as program.conf.rpm save. And then it'll put its new one in the place. So, Generally, as long as things go well, you can erase all these extraneous RPM save and RPM new files, but they're there so that you don't accidentally shoot yourself in the foot. Now I thought about like recreating a circumstance where there would be RPM save and RPM new files, but you're smart enough to understand kind of what I'm saying. You can figure it out. If you see them, that's what they are. Uh, if you update a program on a Red Hat or RPM based system and it crashes and burns, it's probably your old configuration file is probably still there and you can you get that information back. So anyway, uh, that's where it's going to be. Now, as far as where configuration files live, we've covered this in other courses, but I'll show you this is Rocky Linux or a Red Hat based uh, distribution. And basically the forward slash ETC folder is generally where configuration files for system wide services go. Like if you have a, like a web server, the configuration file is going to be in here somewhere, probably inside of a folder, uh, but it's going to be in the etc folder. And no matter what some, anybody tells you, it actually did get its name from etc. Like they just started throwing stuff in another folder called etc. And it became the de facto standard place for configuration files to live. Now there may be like an acronym that somebody crammed in there after the fact, but it just, it stands for etc. You may hear people refer to it as the Etsy folder. You may hear me refer to it as that because Etsy is well fun to say. And you know, ETC at C, huh, C. 
pretty cool, right? Anyway, that's the folder where things live. And that's where I am right now. I'm in the Etsy folder. Uh, if we do LS, we'll see there's a whole bunch of configuration files and folders. Like for example, if we go into uh, the HTTPD folder, which is the Apache program on a Red Hat based system, there's going to be all of these uh, configuration files that are gonna be like in the conf.d folder. Basically, when you make a change, which is outside of the scope of this video for sure, uh, and you need to restart the service, you will almost certainly use system CTL because almost every distribution now uses the system D system initialization system. Wow, that's a lot of system words. Anyway, uh, but a lot of distributions still have a backwards compatible way to start or restart or reload services the old way and that was to say service so i'm going to show you both because apache is one of those that has like the backwards compatibility thing uh, so let's just cd uh, if you wanted to reload the web server on a computer after you made a change for instance you would say sudo system ctl now this is to do it the more up-to-date way using system d sudo systemctl restart, and then the name of the service. And in, in this case, HTTPD. It's gonna ask me for my password, and then it would restart. Now, again, I kind of did the thing that I say you shouldn't necessarily do. You should, we should have done sudo systemctl reload HTTPD. And then if there was a problem with the configuration file, it would have told us but the server would have stayed running with the old, like before we made the screw up configuration. So reload is always safer. If I'm being honest, I do restart a lot unless it's a service that must absolutely stay running. And I do it because I always feel better if I know that it's going to start the next time. And so I will usually just cut corners and rather than reload to make sure that it works and then restart to make sure that it starts properly, um, I'll just do restart. And if it doesn't start, I'm like, oh crap, and I'll fix it. But the service will be down if you do it that way. So it's not the best way to go. Reload is definitely the way to go when you're doing that. But you don't have to use system CTL, although you should. Uh, you can probably still use the service command. Let me show you that. So to restart the same exact service, the web server on this Red Hat based system, we would do sudo service restart. Nope. Uh -huh. that, that's the other thing too. Let me, let me do it and then I'll talk about it. Service HTTPD restart. And it actually tells you what it is doing behind the scenes. It's doing system CTL restart that. The thing that uh, I kind of messed up a little bit there is when you use the service command, now this is a command that was uh, the only way to do it back in the uh, sysv or sys5 initialization scripts with like init.d and all that stuff. Um, you used to have to use the service command to restart a service. Uh, and it would be like sudo service, and then the name of the service, httpd, and then the command you want to do, reload, and then it would reload it. But with system CTL, it's backwards. You do sudo system CTL restart or reload, and then the name of the service. So you you know you got to put the cart before the horse differently, uh, whichever one you use. But the system CTL is the way that you should go about doing it. So that's the deal with like restarting versus reloading. We talked about RPM new and RPM save. Again, you get it. If, if it, there's a new configuration file and it overwrite, and it's going to overwrite yours, it will save yours as the config file dot RPM save. If it doesn't rewrite yours, uh, but there's new like configuration options, it will save the default as RPM new in that same configuration folder uh, that the configuration file goes. Now, lastly, they wanted us to specifically look at the configuration files for the repositories that store where your uh, programs come from, like apt, yum, DNF, okay? And with apt and, or with yum and DNF, there's a lot of intermingling going on. So let's quickly look at the apt configuration because that's pretty standard across any Debian based or Ubuntu based distribution. So this, this is actually Ubuntu, I believe. Yeah, it's Ubuntu. Uh, and so if we go into the etc folder, again, this is also kind of distribution agnostic, etc is where configuration files generally live. Uh, here we can go into the apt folder, apt, and we're gonna see a couple things. One, there's sources.list. We'll look at that just really quickly. I'll just cat it out. Um, and what this 
does is it defines where it goes to fetch the programs. Like if you do an app update, it will get the list of available files here. When you do an app install, this is where it fetches those files from and all the dependencies. It gets them from these various uh, lines. These are the uh, individual repositories that are configured. But having one file can be confusing if you have a bunch of things you want to add on, especially if packages want to add it. It's really difficult for a package to like edit a file that already exists. So what many, many programs in Linux do, including apt yum DNF is if we look LS, there's a folder called sources.list.d. And the nice thing about this is if we go in there, I don't know if this has any in there at all. No, there's none in there, but basically what we can create in here is one single file that has one single line. Well, we can have a couple lines, but it will have specific information for like one type of package. Like let's say uh, we, I mean, open office is included in the standard repository, but let's say that we had like an updated repo for open office. Uh, we could put a file called openoffice.conf in etc. apt sources.list.d and it would pull from that those repositories that we define just like we define all of these. The nice thing is then if we wanted to get rid of that repository, we no longer wanted to use it. We would just be able to delete that file and we wouldn't have to worry about like editing out lines from one big monolithic file. So that's why we have all of these .d folders with individual configuration files in them. It's so it's easier to add and delete without having to edit a file because editing files is just messy. All right, hopefully that makes sense. And uh, once we have that, there's one more, it's not actually in this folder. Uh, let's go back out. It's not in here, but back in the root, um, etc. folder, there is a file. Let's do ls grep apt and we'll see. Oh, I guess it's not there. Uh, I guess there's not an apt.conf. Well, what I was going to show you, I, it used to, and I thought it still did. It used to just reference, it used to be like a, a file app.conf that would reference all of the configuration files in app.conf.d inside the app folder. So if we go back into the app folder and we look in app.conf.d, we'll see there's a bunch of files in there and these are individually loaded. And then if we wanted to get rid of a particular part of the configuration, we could just delete one of these files without having to edit a file. Again, that .d configuration format you'll find all over in Linux because it's very, very convenient. Now, we're not really gonna go over installing in packages and stuff like that. That's a whole different video. This is basically just so you understand how configuration files work and how you can reload stuff after you make changes to configuration files. But I do want you to know that yum and DNF, like the two ways to manage RPM based distributions, they used to be different, but they're kind of like melding together. So let me show you what I mean. So back here, let's clear the screen. We go into the etc folder again, and we do ls minus L and I'm going to uh, grep for yum. Okay, we're gonna see a couple things. We're gonna see uh, yum.repos.d is right here. Okay, so again, same sort of a thing. We can put repo files in this .d folder and it will read each individual one up. There is a yum folder and then there is yum.conf, which is, if we look over here, uh, it's a file. Okay, it's not a directory. Yum.conf is a file and it points to, meaning it's a symbolic link to DNF uh, the DNF folder, dnf.conf. So they share a single configuration file because like I said, they're starting to kind of merge into one. There's a lot of symbolic linking going on. If we were to look at ls minus l, uh, the yum folder, we're gonna see everything in here is a symbolic link to the DNF folder uh, equivalent. So pluginconf.d is in the DNF plugins folder. Uh, protected.d points to the DNF folder protected.d. So they really are merging together quite a bit. And if we look in ls minus l yum dot repos dot d, we're going to see here we actually have some yum repos. These are actual files uh, that do live in there. Uh, and let's, since we're looking at all the things, if we look at ls uh, dnf, we're gonna see there are individual folders in here, including um, the DNF file, which again is symbolically linked 
to the yum configuration file up here. These are all together and these are where the configuration for the package manager itself goes. Again, we don't need to go into it and like check stuff out and see how it works. It's more an understanding that the apt system, the DNF system, the yum system, they are systems with configuration files, just like every other service on your computer. Now they generally don't have something running in the background where you'd have to reload them. Uh, they generally read the configuration files when you launch them. So when you type yum, then it will read in the configuration file. There's not like a yum daemon that's running and we need to restart. Hopefully that makes sense. So with apt, it's pretty straightforward. I wish it was a little more straightforward with yum and DNF because they're in this interim phase where yum is still around sort of, and some of the stuff in the yum is symbolically linked to DNF and some of the DNF stuff is symbolically linked to yum. And it's a little bit strange, uh, but nonetheless, they both do the same thing. So you can use either one or both without worrying about like, conflicting or messing up your system by using one and then the other and then go back to the other. So that is how those configuration things work. Remember reload is safer than restart because if you've messed up your configuration, it won't stop the program. The program will stay running, give you a chance to fix the configuration you screwed up, try to reload. And if it reloads, then it will have that new configuration in place, right? That is just good advice, even though I don't always follow it myself. And with that, I encourage you to play around with both systems, but learn everything, do what you love, and most importantly, be kind. I'll see you in the next video.